Peter Daniels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. I hope you're going to understand my accent. <clears throat> I had some problems with yours. <laughs> but you talk about food and you call it chow, that's Chinese. You talk about the great prairies and that's French. You talk about the corrals and that's Spanish. And when I meet you, you say, there you go, and I haven't gone anywhere at all. <laughs> what I'm going to try and give you tonight is a business perspective filtered through the Word of God. I trust that I'm able to give you five things. Firstly, some background. Secondly, a short, detailed summary of global history up until now. Thirdly, have a look at what we can learn from the past that can be translated into a modern world. Fourthly, how we can win and claim the high ground. And hopefully, if we have enough time, get four people from the audience and set their life goals for them from a biblical perspective and hit it on target. Now, let me give you some background. <clears throat> I'm 75 years of age. My wife and I have been married for 54 years to each other. <clears throat> we have three children and eight grandchildren who think I'm the fourth member of the Trinity. I've never gone through formal schooling. I've never had the disadvantage of going to university. <clears throat> I came from a third generation welfare recipient family. I had four fathers and two mothers and most of my relatives had free board and lodgings with King George VI. That meant of course they were in jail. <clears throat> I went to school as a normal child goes to school but I was suffering from the debilitating disease called diphtheria so I went very late and they wanted to put me in a brain damaged class called opportunity class. I learnt nothing at school. I've never passed a grade at school. I had problems in articulation, incredible dyslexia. I can get lost in a hotel lobby. But on May the 25th, 1959, as an illiterate bricklayer at 26 years of age, I went along to a Billy Graham crusade. Yes. And when I heard the gospel in clear terms for the first time, I suddenly realised I was equal with all men before God. And I reason that if I was equal with all men before God, I no need to accept inequality with anyone. I was a son of a king. That's right. <laughs> and I wish you could know the difference that that makes. I suddenly didn't become intellectually brilliant, but I knew that I knew that I knew that something had happened and I wanted to be able to respond to that. But how do you respond when God gives you a dream so big that you can't even comprehend it? It was a simple dream to see how much money one human being could give away in their lifetime from poverty. We weren't ordinarily poor, we had to reach up to touch bottom. <laughs> I had so many unsatisfied judgment summonses, I was thinking about papering a wall in our house. How do you handle that? Well, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have a mentor, I didn't have anyone to help me. And then I purchased three dictionaries. I put one next to my bed, I put one in the toilet, that's a good place to read. And I put one in my excuse for a motor car and I need to tell you about this motor car because it was a 1937 Ford V8 Clubman sedan that had been rolled three times. The hood was crushed in, the windows were gone, we kept the doors on with wire. It wasn't the gasoline that bothered me, it was how much oil this confounded thing used. <laughs> if I drove it very carefully, I could get 14 miles to the gallon of oil. If anyone showed any disrespect for my motor car, I would go right out on the highway and stop all the traffic. As it backed up and they swore at me and shook their fists, I just stayed there. 
When enough people backed up, I put my foot on the clutch, slapped it on the accelerator, and I baptized them in oil. <laughs> I went through those dictionaries frontwards and then backwards. I got people to tell me what they meant, and then I checked with two or three other people to make sure the first one told me the truth. You've seen Crocodile Dundee. Australians are great kidders. People ask me around the world, what are Australians like? <clears throat> well, they're very balanced people. They have a chip on each shoulder. <laughs> At that time, I went through them frontwards and then backwards until I understood every single word. Then I read 2,000 biographies. And then I studied law, accountancy, philosophy, theology, modern ancient history, politics and economics. I found the mind was like a muscle and it could be developed. Yes. At that time, a gentle giant, a doctor, put his arm around me and for the next 15 years, for two and a half hours, every Saturday morning on my knees, he taught me Bible and faith and prayer. And he showed me that the Bible was the only literature known to man that gives a futuristic view of history. And he shared with me the analogy of Jesus and he showed me that to economists, he could get money from a fish's mouth. Amen. To the botanist, he is a rose of Sharon. To the futurologist, he has an everlasting plan. To the paleontologist, he was there before prehistoric life. To the astrophysicist, he controls the stars. To the physician, he healed the sick with a touch. To the architect, he is the temple of God. To the philanthropist, he fed the 5,000. To the builder, he is a cornerstone. To the teacher, he is the living word. To the astronaut, he ascended in the heavens unaided. To the engineer, he can stop the waves. To the leader, he led by serving. To the general, he commands an army of archangels. To the philosopher, he is the way, the truth and the life. To the politician, the government is on his shoulders. To the musician, the heavens sang at his birth. To the evangelist, he has preached for 2,000 years. Or to the judge, he gave Solomon his wisdom. To the anthropologist, he is the creator of all mankind. To the meteorologist, he stopped the sun. To the caterer, he turned the water into wine. This is the Jesus that we serve. Yes. And I believe that God gave me this dream to see how much money one human being could give away in their lifetime. So I went into business after all that and I lost everything. And I want to tell you, that'll clear your sinuses. <laughs> I paid it back and went into business a second time, lost it again. You learn nothing new from the second kick from a horse. <laughs> I paid it back and I was going into business the third time. My wife said to me, Peter, just get a job. <laughs> this is not working. Surely God's not speaking to you. You're spending all this money on books and tape, but nothing's happening. Peter Jr. needs some shoes for school. Winter's coming. Graham needs a sweater and I'm pregnant again. And you've spent all this money on books. On our 33rd wedding anniversary, I bought her a beautiful necklace, 49 carat opal with 33 diamonds. I mean, this thing's so big when she walks, she has to walk like this. <coughs> I said, if you haven't complained about the books and tapes I bought lately. <laughs> Well, I went into business the third time and lost it again. What do you do when your dreams start to fade? You reach for one more dream. We should never give up, let up or shut up until God takes us up. Well, I went into business the third time and lost it again, paid it back. Went in business the fourth time and bought one of the largest real estate corporations of its kind in our nation with offices in Singapore and Hong Kong. Today, we sold them out some years ago. Our corporations extend right around the world. We are the only corporation on the face of the earth that has its own private currency. We're the only family in the world that has its own private bullion bank, gold and silver. We have no overdrafts, no loans, no mortgages anywhere in the world. We keep large reserves of gold and silver and cash. We never go to banks. Two companies have paid me a million dollars for advice. One was a Texan company. Paid me a million dollars, only took me 11 minutes. He made 120 million, so he did all right. An Australian company paid me a million dollars to chair 12 meetings. We made him 150 million. Now I'm your wake up call. Not very often you'll get people to come and talk to you like I'm going to talk to you today, but you need to wake up. Nobody, nobody's interested in us. We're the untouchables, we're the lepers. 
The one time I had to fire 10,000 people. How do you think I how do you think I behaved when I went to bed that night, seeing the faces of all these people going into their homes, weeping before their wives, how we're we going to pay our mortgage? God gave me another dream as a young man 50 years ago. It was to change the world for 300 years. I'm sure you think, well, that's a crazy comment to make. How can one person change the world in their lifetime? Or let me hasten to remind you, in biblical times, Abraham changed the world in his lifetime. Moses changed the world in his lifetime. David changed the world in his lifetime. Gideon changed the world in his lifetime. In more modern times, a man called Mahatma Gandhi with what he called Satyagraha, which was soul force. He broke the change of colonial power. He he changed the world in his lifetime. Henry Ford changed the world in his lifetime when he set the world moving via the automobile. And Roger Bannister changed the world in his lifetime when he ran the first four minute mile and he proved that the efforts of human endeavor are yet to come. My hero, Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill, the last great English bulldog. This man that mobilized an English language and sent it into battle when he sent those young men up on those Spitfire planes during the Battle of Britain, which caused him to say, never be in the field of human conflict, as so many owed so much to so few. So let us brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth would last for a thousand years, men would still say this, this was their finest hour. He changed the world in his lifetime. Bach and Beethoven changed the world in their lifetime as they expanded our consciousness in the area of symphony and song. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he changed the world when there on Capitol Hill, before the television audience of the world, when he gave that famous speech that said, I have a dream. He said, I have a dream that my four little children will not be judged by the colour of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Amen. We have travelled 12,000 miles to ask you a very simple question. I hope it haunts you for the rest of your life. It's a question that Joseph's father asked his son when he said, my son, what is this dream that you have? What is this dream that you have? For many of you, it was alive and well when you were a little younger. You'd go for a swim at the beach or the lake and lie in the warm sand. You'd stand in front of a wood fire on a cold winter's night or under the starry heavens of a hot summer night. And you would do what men and women in all ages have done. You would contrast a picture of what you are against what you would like to become. What we'd like to do tonight is to try and turn back on that dream machine. But before I do, I want to read something from Scripture from Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37, and I'll read it to you. And it says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around and behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live and I'll put sinew on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath on you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked to the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath, 
Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath. Breathe on these slain, that they might live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. My dear friends, we are in an unusual time in the history of global events. We have before us today in this modern, fast-moving world an iconoclastic body of fanatics boasting world domination. They are infiltrating our legal system, our school, and under the guise of compromise are seeking to manipulate our culture, proclaiming a religion stained with blood and carnage, warning all who challenge their claims and demanding change with protests and threats, inflexible to the extreme, evil in intent, with a preparedness to sacrifice the flower of their youth to create terror, while frightened old men hide in safely within the high echelon of their leadership who are protected by a seemingly impregnable fortress as they manipulate a shady doctrine while they are protected from harm. We have before us a hideous monstrosity with an absence of mercy that acknowledges no boundaries and they are mistaken in the belief that we Christians are paralysed by fear, impotent, powerless, incompetent, shattered and demoralized and that we cannot challenge them. Who do they think they are? (laughs) Or more importantly, who do they think they're dealing with here? You see, it has been tried before. We have been thrown to the lions, crucified upside down, stoned, beheaded, burned at the stake. We're still here. Don't they understand? Are there scholars so inept that they ignore the pages of biblical history? We are the heirs of God's promise. We hold within our souls the title deeds of everlasting life. Our God is omnipotent. It was he who parted the Red Sea and the River Jordan who through a shepherd boy killed a giant called Goliath and crushed an army. It was our God who appointed kings and deposed tyrants. It was our God who through a trumpet sound and a shout collapsed the walls of Jericho. It was our God who destroyed an empire with Gideon's 300 men. It was our God through a man called Abraham who built a nation. It was our God who turned a valley of dry bones into an invincible army Who do they think they're dealing with here? You see, in the last 2,000 years, since the birth, death and resurrection of our Saviour Jesus Christ, that spontaneously created the Christian church and has, by its impact, it has made throughout the world, affected the march of human progress in a way that no other event, militarily, politically, economically, academically, scientifically or socially has ever been able to eclipse. The dynamic lives of the early disciples and apostles who witnessed firsthand the atmosphere of those events, together with the great deeds and miracles of that era, were followed by fervent men and women who dared to be different. And because their conviction and experience was more precious than life itself, they ignited a bright light of hope and salvation that will never be extinguished. Those who lit that incandescent flame amidst the darkness so long ago did so with the assurance and accuracy of the ancient scrolls that recorded God's majesty and involvement from Genesis to Malachi 
and with the promise of a star that would shine forever in the hearts and souls of men. Unfortunately, the slow ancient progress of man continued full of disobedience towards the statutes and commandments of God that so often reprimands became more consistent than blessing. And yet the forgiveness and mercy and goodness of Almighty God will stand forever as a monument for His desire to see His people enjoy blessings by obedience. And He who a thousand ages is but a day continues to demonstrate His forgiveness in abundance against a sinful and disobedient world. We tonight are able to look through the hourglass of history and through the telescope of faith as we stand on the threshold of this great new millennium and feel within our souls a deep consciousness of the lateness of the hour as we watch the sands of time move quickly by or we must sense the urgent need for a change in our approach without the compromise of the inerrancy of our holy coal. Just in those days gone by, they stood firm and unmoving on the mandate of God. We too must resolve to bear with renewed strength the same high standard as they uphold while we seek to live and proclaim the same message in a fast changing world of economics, politics, technology and apathy. From Archimedes to the tragedy of the cross of Calvary, from the destruction of Rome to the birth of Muhammad, from the march of Islam across the Middle Eastern world and Africa, to the great Asiatic power of China under the Tang Dynasty, which was followed by the Holy Crusade that burst on the scene for nearly 100 years. Then history as we know it made a giant leap with what was called progress when we entered into the beauty of the early classical Renaissance era with all its extravagance and wonder. While the average family still continued to be poor and remained dominated by the rich and the powerful as they lived subdued and exploited. Then we were visited by the unexpected entrance of the Black Plague that killed one third of the population of Europe while the march of human misery continued as Mahomet the conqueror takes Constantinople and brings Ottoman rule to Europe. And then suddenly <laughs> the world was awestruck when in 1517 a monk called Martin Luther courageously publishes a list of 95 complaints against the Catholic Church and the Great Reformation was born. And as a consequence, Frederick the Great gave Catholics and Protestants equal rights by freeing the presence on his private estates and abolishing the use of torture. Change continued to take place and by 1763, Great Britain, which was the embodiment of the British Empire, who under the grace of God had a 40 year jump start on the Industrial Revolution and became the leading world power and was responsible for two thirds of Europe's industrial growth output and by 1860, its energy consumption was five times that of the United States or Germany, six times that of France, 155 times that of Russia, and was also responsible for 20% of the world's commerce and industry, and one third of the world's merchant fleet sailed under the British flag. And then we entered into the 20th century. We departed from our trusty friend, the horse. We went on to develop and use unimaginable weapons in two, two world wars and dozens of other conflicts, slaughtering over 200 million people. While we traveled to the moon and sought to reach out to the galaxies and beyond. During this time, our scientists created medical miracles to extend the lifespan for some while others died of hunger and disease. Now I gave you a backdrop on that to ask you a question. Well, what have we achieved? What is our overall assessment? 
Where do we stand now? Will history continue to repeat itself? Or will we as Christians be honest and courageous enough to say some of the things we're doing now are not working? Don't we understand that we're in danger of losing the battle for the souls of mankind? Must we go from crisis to crisis? Or will the Christian church and its people rise again and dare to proclaim a message of peace, progress and prosperity? Or will we continue to live in a vague, mystical, pacifist dream while our aspirations remain fossilised by fear, inaction and ignorance? Are we destined to stumble along, singing a song of triumph and exaggerating our feeble <coughs> achievements? Or are we going to be courageous enough to stop and take stock of our failures and our inadequacies and create a plan for the next 100 years with clear, concise measurements? I'm tired of Christians telling me that God's not interested in numbers when he wrote a book called Numbers. <laughs> we need works that follow our words of faith so that we will not be an embarrassment to the history of the saints of old, but with world-shattering events, we could make the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Industrial Revolution, yes, even the race for space, merely a flickering lamp of the past against the brightness of a testament of works following the faithfulness of a Christianity stimulated by the hand of God with a good conscience towards a glorious future. So what is our answer? How will we respond? More importantly, when will we respond? <laughs> At this time, I believe when sin, debauchery, vacillation, fear and division hold us back. We need to revisit the times and word of Dietrich Bonhoeffer when he stood alone against the atrocities being carried out in Germany by Adolf Hitler while many of the leaders in all echelons of the Christian church were raising their hands in Nazi salute, he wrote to some of his pastoral friends, and I quote, he said, we have been the silent witnesses of evil deeds. We have been drenched by many storms. We have learnt the art of equivocation and pretense. Are we still of any use? Are we still of any use? We see what's happening out there. At that same time that he said that, Winston Churchill in London echoed these words when he said, and I quote, the power of the wicked is always enhanced by the hesitation and timidity of the righteous. Unquote. We have abolished slavery, but a more penetrating question needs to be asked against the historical writings of the time in respect of the supposed evangelical activities of those days. Why did we allow it to happen? Today, there are many great churches in our city that faithfully can proclaim the word of God. But are the masses in the pews living any better? Are they earning more money? Are they able to build a heritage for their children's children? And furthermore, do they occupy positions of leadership and economic power in our society? Never before in the history of Christendom have we had so many seminars and books on leadership by those who have never attained any prominence of leadership in the government or the commercial world. Many of them couldn't lead a group in silent prayer. We're reduced to teaching management theory in our churches and mouthing cliches that have very little reality to the real world. And the Christian church is adopting market and commercial techniques that are cold and calculating, offensive and distant, when in fact the marketplace ought to be taking its lead from the church. And at the same time, when we win a rich or powerful person to Christ, the first thing we do is try to tame them which means afterwards they're not able to function in the real world. Some of our pastors are surrounded by minders, voicemails, messy banks, questioning staff, almost to the point where you cannot reach the hem of their garment to be healed. Too far the pendulum has swung. 
We've been sending medical missionaries, explorers and medical aid and finance to Africa for 200 years. We have not changed the economics, the politics or the religion. Why don't we stop doing what we're, we're failing in? It's not America that's the richest nation in the world. It's Africa. More bauxite, more tin, more oil, more gold, more silver, more iron ore, more arable land than anywhere else on earth. When are we going to re-examine our plans? This is the nation that we have to preserve. When we look back at what we've been doing, we could apply Shakespeare's words in a summer's night dreams when they said, Lord, what fools these mortals be. What we need is a completely new approach in our mission and winning the world to Christ that does six things. Firstly, that it strengthens the authority and the outreach of the local church. The, it happens at the local church level. Yes, Secondly, provide large increases in our available finance. Thirdly, upgrade the commitment and ability of the laity. Fourthly, speak with a united voice with power on many biblical issues that we all ignore. Back in 1971 when I fought pornography and won a Supreme Court action for the first time for 200 years in the British Empire when we stopped them using women as pornographic objects, the church was nowhere to be seen. Fifthly, develop a Christian personal code of conduct. Can I believe that we've been Christian for 2,000 years and we don't have a code of conduct that is simple, short and biblical? And sixthly, get together. Have a plan with measurements and time frames for the next 100 years. Over 20 years ago, I started a very different kind of organisation. We have many businesses in many parts of the world, but this was different. It accepts no donation. It's called the World Centre of Entrepreneurial Studies, and up this time we've conducted two and three day seminars right throughout the world in nearly 1,000 Christian churches and created more millionaires in the Christian church than anyone in history. We're the largest supplier in the world of programs, films, seminars, strategic economics, planning information, books. And our research has shown quite clearly that the great missions outreach as we know it today started with William Carey on October the 2nd, 90, uh, 1792 and the Bible Society thereafter. Both were economically stimulated by the great industrial revolution, which was grasped by the Calvinists who were devout Christians, hardworking, generous in their tithes and offering, and it was largely through these people the Protestant work ethic was created and the finance of the local church was invigorated, which enabled them to grow and to start global evangelism as we know it today and we have all been the recipients of this great gift. Surely there must be something we can learn from this great movement of God that was nurtured and sustained by those early Christian entrepreneurs. I hear the lament. Everybody can't go into business. Nobody's doing it. Ask yourself the question in your church, who is doing international business? Ask yourself the question, if you've got a church of at least a thousand people, are there five millionaires in your church? We have to learn something before time echoes those chilling words, too late. And some people are starting to think that it is. So let's go back to my earlier question. Where do we stand now? And pose two more questions that will provide some answers. Question number one, where do we stand now? Well, it depends on where you get your information from. We have our own research team because there are many variations, but let's look at some facts and what is generally accepted. And I'll list them in three alphabetic categories. A, the debt, B, the future, and C, the plan. Now, I don't like to say that, but let's get to the debt. America is the only remaining superpower and it has a debt at the moment if you believe the politicians. And we have a saying in Australia, how do you know if your politician is lying, his lips are moving? <laughs> you owe eight trillion. Try to come to grips with that, the Americans here. 
This means that if someone went into business the day that Jesus was born and lost a million dollars a day for 2,000 years, they'd be in better shape than your government. Your politician tell you it's 8 trillion. My research team says it's between 18 and 22 trillion. David Walker, controller general of the United States, said on November the 15th, 2005, these words, and I quote, anyone who says you're going to grow your way out of this problem would not pass a math test. We face a democratic tsunami. Isabel Sawhill, the economist from Brookings Institution on the same day said, and again I quote, the growing gulf between what the government spends and what it takes in is like a category six fiscal hurricane, unquote. And summing up, let me say, the United States of America sometime in the future will face a major economic reversal which could be more devastating than the Great Depression and could last up to 15 years which the church and its people is not qualified to handle. How can I say that? Because we did two films on economics and submitted to the Video and Film Festival in Chicago against 1,600 other entrants, including General Motors, from all over the world, and we won the gold for directorship and the silver for content because of its accuracy. Now let's move to item B, the future. As we see it, and we're in the top 10% of advisors. Prediction of world events up to 2025 with a few adjustments in general terms in economics, power, production and influence of, are as follows if the present trend continues. China will be the world leader in almost all category, all the four categories by 2025. Time is running out. Russia could be a distant second because of its careful financial management together with oil, mineral resources and agriculture. We must remember that in the 19th century, Russia was the largest exporter of agriculture in the world and produced over 80% of the world's cotton. India, which has at the moment over 300 million middle class and is making giant leaps in manufacturing, trade, banking and technology will be the third world power and America, because it would not have recovered completely from its debt and st spending habits, may take up to 50 years to do better than fourth place. Now, I want to tell you, that scares the living daylights out of me. I am pro-American. There's never been a country in the history of the world, and I have 6,000 years of history on my office wall. I know history. I'm a student of history. I've studied it for 50 years. There has never been a nation in the history of the world that has been as benevolent as the United States of America. Never. I do not want the Chinese to be the superpower. I do not want Russia to be the superpower. I do not want India to be the superpower. Well, let's move on to number six. Item C, the plan, and examine some probabilities and options. At first glance, the probabilities appear to be quite grim for the United States of America because there are no plans at hand either to stop borrowing money or a payback plan, and furthermore, no serious attempt has been made to handle long-term welfare payments that are continually being abused. Right. Now, in respect to to options for the United States, there are several, and I want you to pay very careful attention to this. And in particular, I would see two options as the most promising, which could change the whole economic global scenario. And if they are used in unison, could ensure continuity of America's predominance in the world economically, politically, and military power for at least the next 500 years. Option one, America is desperately needs to have a renaissance of values. Because at this point of time, the positioning, the power, the possibilities are waiting there for you at your own back door. I've spoken to some of your congressmen. Why don't you start at Alaska and go down to Chile and form the United Americas? You've got another 350 million people down there. Include Mexico in that. Lend them billions of money. You just print it. You don't have anything. Just print it. Put them on the same currency. You could have a locomotive going from Alaska right down to Chile. Look, you've got oil, gas, you've got 
iron ore, you've got gold, you've got silver, you've got water, you've got arable land, and you've got 350 million people where you could lift the standard of living. You could put a missile base from Chile right up to Alaska and keep the world free for 500 years. You could by forming the United Americas, developing Mexico and combining with Latin America and Brazil, provide a population market larger than the European Union, more unified than Asia, more aggressive than Africa, and without the tensions of the Middle East. You could build giant highways and diesel locomotives. And because of your location and your proximity, you will outprice, outmaneuver, outwork any economic attack, even from the great nation of China, while at the same time lift and impoverish people from bondage and despair. This is the challenge of the 21st century, and you can do it without losing your identity and by reaching an agreement on a common currency and become the free enterprise engine that would drive the most dynamically, climatically diverse group of nations in the world by creating the United America. And you can do it within your region without many of the complexities of foreign trade, political, ethnic, and historical bar barriers. Now I'm talking particularly to the Americans here. Turn away from your allegiance that you have bought with gifts of food, finance and philanthropy. Let them keep it. They're biting the hand that feeds you. God made you the greatest superpower in the history of the world. Don't weaken it with alliances that will finally compete against you. That's option one. Option two. Option two involves the Christian church. I'm going to say something here that I've only ever said once before. I'm looking at Pastor Godot when I say this. I'm a Baptist. <laughs> I'm not charismatic. I'm, I see it a bit different. But 95% of my friends are charismatics. We have a deep affection for one another. But let me tell you, from my point of view, the resurgence of the economic power in America is going to come through the black church. Why? Because God lives in the praise of his people. They mightn't be able to do much else sometimes, but boy, they can praise. And I've committed myself through Bishop Eddie Long to spend five years with 50 churches and just see how many millionaires we can go. They're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Option two involves the Christian church because we are the disorganized global army waiting to be mobilized. And in fact, we are the world's only rescue squad right. that can be used. And I believe the needs indicate that it's time for the Christian church to take its rightful place in world affairs as a guide to the nations, as a seasoning to the people, as a lead in economics and a light to morality. We can no longer depend upon the United Nations, which was to be a hope when it was created. And we must remember the President Roosevelt's words when he presented the four essentials of human freedom, and I quote, the freedom of speech and expression, the freedom of worship, the freedom from want, and the freedom from fear, unquote. Winston Churchill said in 1946 when the United Nations was formed, and I quote, he said to make sure that its work is fruitful, that it is a reality and not a sham, that it is a force for action and not merely a frothing of words, that it is a true temple of peace in which the shields of many nations can someday be hung and not merely a cockpit in the Tower of Babel, unquote. It's come to the point where diplomats say privately that nothing short of the frontal lobotomy would bring the United Nations ambitions into line. Now we, I'm talking about us, we are the light of the world, not them out there. We, the Christian church, must wake them from our slumber because never before in the history of international economics has there ever been an opportunity to capture the business highways of the world and it may never happen again for 2,000 years. This is a unique moment in history 
With the uncertainties of international trade, every business is unconnected and under threat. Every country is involved in industrial protectionism. Every bank and lending institution are overstretched. Every national identity is being blurred. Immediate gratification and survival is a watchword. Our governments seem powerless. The World Bank appears to have no compass and is desperately short of money. The OPEC nations are forever changing the rules. The European Union appears to be in disunion. And the United Kingdom for now remains a derelict empire. And I'm sorry to say it to my American friends, but the United States of America is losing its grip. China, Russia and India are anxiously seeking trade opportunities and while the whole world markets are waiting to be possessed, I mean, they're just sitting there. The largest and the greatest power force in the history of the world, the Christian church is not even aware of what is taking place and has never come to grips with the realisation if you do not reach the business world, you cannot affect or change the economic conscience of a nation. And for too long, we, the people of the Christian church, have accepted our lot in life as a kind of obedient drudgery. For too long, we have listened to the theorists who walk us through the fog of doubt. For too long, we have met at the table of maintenance seekers and sat hungry at their table. For too long, we have sought direction from boneless wonders who wear masks of piety and feign deep beliefs who have no idea what is happening in the real world while they keep our souls unsatisfied and our dreams dormant. It's time for Christians to take back the economics and for our people to own major corporations instead of being employment fodder, suffocating in the amorphous club of sameness. But I want to tell you, we must win in the marketplace. We must win in the universities. We must win in the law courts. We must win in the media. We must win in the governments. We must defend our faith, our churches and our families to the last drop of sweat, to the last dollar, to the last argument, to the last word, and if necessary, life itself. No more vacillating, no more backing down. And just as God spoke to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy said, you have skirted this mountain long enough, turn northward. We are in desperate need of a change of direction. We have to take the high ground. And in contrast to that statement, let me tell you that the churches worldwide, I see debt, no unification, no direction, no measurements and no code of conduct. And so we must ask the question, how can we take the high ground? Is there a formula? Is there a plan that's honourable, biblical, productive and doable? The answer is yes, there is. We win by coordinating our efforts without being divided by our differences. We win by strengthening the pastor and the local church without usurping their authority. We win by enhancing the loyalty, quality and income of the people towards the local church. That is the formula. And what is the plan? Here is the plan. How it can be achieved without standing results. It's by providing world-class, Bible-based, proven training on entrepreneurship and economics with unparalleled opportunities in local, national and international trade. We must stimulate the people in the pews to own their own businesses, to look after their families, to build a heritage for their children's children and to fund the dreams and aspirations of their pastors. And it can be done. We started just over 12 months ago, the dream that God gave me as a 26 year old man that I wrote on the back of a cereal package called the Gabriel Call. We go to your church with the DVDs, we train a minimum of 20 of your people over an eight week period, how to go into entrepreneurship. We train your pastors. I've been to nearly a thousand churches. We show you how to double your income. We show you how to have an income base that never goes dry. We show you how to choose a board of directors and how to get the knotheads off the board if they're a nuisance. <laughs> this is the largest single initiative for financing evangelism through the local church in the history of the world. And we do not accept donations. 
If you want to get involved as a church, uh, your people have to sign a document that they accept the authority of their pastor, that they are tithers, and they're either in business or will go in business with 12 months. We're not going to train knotheads. Uh, and the pastor co-signs that. We're not going to have people telling the pastor that they're tithe and they hang on to their money. We've already got over a thousand corporations doing it already. Well, I really, I'm looking at this clock. I don't want to go over time, but I believe I've got about another, about an, another 40 minutes. Is that about right? Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. The Gabriel call over the next 20 years will provide $200 billion for evangelism. It'll be the greatest economic thrust in the history of world events. It's bigger than the landing at Normandy and nobody gets killed. <laughs> now, it's originally started for the English-speaking world and whether we agree with it or not, whether we feel comfortable with it or not, it's the English-speaking world that has mobilised evangelism over the last 200 years. But already we've got 20 nations involved. We got a call some time back from Iraq where the Baptists in Iraq want to get involved in it as well. Now, this may be the only opportunity in history with world events when timing, technology, opportunity and plans are in close harmony together. But I want to be frank with you. Some may be casualties in the process and find the going more strenuous than they can bear. Christians think, you know, if God's in it, I'll go into business, everything will be fine. Well, they're reading a different Bible to me because if God's in it, all hell will break loose. But we'll, but, we'll, but we'll have a red cross. We'll have a pickup. The people that fall by the way, we'll pick them up. We won't, we're not going to allow the devil to take any prisoners. Others may give up at the first clear view of the road ahead. But those that are involved in the Gabriel call that finish the course, complete the journey and obtain the victor's crown, yes, they'll be able to pass down a heritage not only to their family, but also the whole human family. And it will be written in the pages of Christian history that a financial Christian army passed through the ends of time without shields, spears, cannons, but rather a unique armory that carried as its banner a single word called hope. And it held it high for all to see the lost and the misguided world that needed the change that was wrought by a modern day multitude that represented the call of old, sounding the trumpet with words Good news, and with God's help, we shall prevail. But what about those that don't get involved? Some of you are going to say, well, the timing's not right for me. I'm not too sure all about this. What are you going to tell your grandchildren? I have a track record of success, a very good track record of success. I haven't always been right. But if I'm wrong in this, if I don't get one million Christians in the English-speaking world in the freehold business of their choice, and I am 90% wrong, we'll still have 100,000. If you've got any idea what that'll do when I go to one of these Middle Eastern countries and I talk to their president and tell them I will take 5,000 entrepreneurs into their country to fix the economy of their bottom line and when they pick themselves up off the floor and they say, well, the United Nations can't do that, the World Bank can't do that, the Vatican can't do that, well, we can. And we discuss and, and we, we work out a taxation deal and, and everything else that we have to do. And finally I say, well, we've got some problems. I'll say, well, what are they? I'll say, well, you're burning Christian churches in this country. I'll say, well, we've got political problems, we've got social problems, we've got religious problems, we're doing our best. Well, I haven't told you everything. There's more? Yes. You stop doing that and I'll bring in another thousand businesses. Suddenly they say all problems can be solved. <laughs> Well, what are you going to tell your grandchildren at 2025 when this is finished? I may be wrong. There may be more. I always undercommit and overperform. One man met me at the front there and he said, you know, you changed my life. You came to our church and you said you always undercommit, overperform. 
What if we get more? Ah, what are you going to tell your grandchildren? When they ask you what happened, granddad, what happened, grandma, when the greatest economic thrust in the history of the world of the Christian church was underway and now here it is finished and there are great cathedrals and churches and, and we have changed the political scene, we've changed the economic scene, we've changed the military scene because my Bible, unless yours is different, says money answers all things. What are you going to tell your kids? Well, I, we, we weren't too sure about it. Or well, you're going to say we got involved and that's why you're living the way you are today. Well, let me pose one or two other questions. How do you treat your business people? I mentioned we are untouchables. Or if I went to a, any nice church and drove my Rolls Royce in and my wife had some of her diamonds and we came into your church, you'd whisper and say, who is that? And they'd wonder and you'd be very nice to me. But you don't realise that I'm carrying a very heavy burden and that the people are coming to your church and paying their tithes, their gifts and their offerings because I have put my life on the line and my reputation on the line to give them work. The next week, my wife and I decide to make a change. I put a beard on and ruffle my hair up and wear some old clothes and a putty nose and she puts a cotton dress on and we take a couple of snotty nosed kids with us. And we go to the church and the first thing you say is get one of the deacons to talk to these people. They need help. I'm hurting. I'm bleeding. You never come and talk to me unless you want something. I hurt. Business people hurt. They need what you can give. In the Gabriel call, in the pastor's portion, we show you how to pastor corporations. That's a new thought for you. How to pastor corporations. How to go out there in a corporation. How to get in the door. How to win them to Christ. How to raise money. Hey, you've never done it before. Now I'm looking at this clock and I want to do something else before I finish. What I would have liked to have done is show you how to have a large continued financial flow of funds in your church that will never stop, that requires no investment, no management, and no delays. Also, how to double the size of your congregation with very little effort. Thirdly, how to pastor corporations. We could spend two hours on that. Four, how to raise large sums of money of finance from business owners. It's easier than you think. And five, how to select and build a board of directors. But what I'd like to do now is to try and get your attention in a different direction. Would we have four lay people, two men and two women here, who'd be prepared to come out here and act as guinea pigs for me? You're a lay person, you're not a pastor? You come out, sir. Have I got another man? Come out, sir, come and sit up here. Can I have two women? Two ladies? Come on, ma'am, come out here. Is there another one somewhere? Where? Okay, come out. Now what we're going to do here is show you how to reach your life goals from a biblical perspective and hit it on target. And I'm going to move with this. And any of you that uh, would like to do something significant, this is one of the, this is the most important program that we produce in the World Centre of Entrepreneurial Study. I've only brought six with me. Everything I've learned in my entire lifetime is in here. Because I'm dyslexic, I can read eight books at a time. I create formulas for business that people pay millions of dollars for. Everything I've learned in my lifetime is in that program. It's called Destiny of the Third Millennium. It's created more millionaires than anything else in history. It's recognized as the most comprehensive success program in the entire world. We've only got six here. If you get this, you are locked into the World Center of Entrepreneurial Studies, which means if you have a business problem any time for the next five years and as many problems as you have, we put our research team on it and get back to you usually within 72 hours. We've researched your problem and we've provided an answer and that's free of charge for five years. 
as biblical. As a matter of fact, one of the doctors of theology at the Dallas Theological Seminary went through it and said, man, this is good. Don't change a thing. If you're interested, go out the book table. Anyone that's interested in the Gabriel call, leave your business card or your name and address and phone up, preferably a cell phone number, and we will send you a brochure from Australia. I haven't got any of my books here. They've all sold out. Uh, we've just been <laughs> so busy, uh, but we've got six of these only. Now, if you don't take them, that's all right. We've got to send some back to Bishop Eddie Long and, and the other church we've been to. Now, let me deal with these people. We've got a microphone for them. <coughs> Someone got a microphone for these people. Take that one there. The first man, what's your name, sir? First name. My name is Lee. L-E? L-E-E. -E. L-E-E, -E. pass it on to the next person. Next person. Mike. 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 Next person. Rhonda. Wanda. Rhonda. R-H. Wanda. Christy. Christy. Chris. Christy. Christy. I don't know whether that's right. This is what I want you to do. I want the th four of you to think of three things you want in your lifetime. I want you to watch this. I want you to do it as if I'm talking to you. We're going to do something here we do in the World Centre of Entrepreneurial Studies. It'll cost you $25,000 to have it done. We're just going to do this very, very quickly. I want you to think of three things that you want in your lifetime and you can never have anything else, but you can have these three things to do everything you want to do materialistically in your lifetime. Okay? I want to see you dream. I want you to do that out here too. Paul the Apostle said, I'll be back to you in just a minute. You ought to have it off pat. Paul the Apostle said, I press towards the goal, the mark of my high calling, forgetting those things which are behind. If you follow the ancient Greek, it talks about a discriminate forgetfulness of the past, forgetting the hurts, the disappointments, the brokenness. And he says, all who are mature should have such a view of things. I'm talking here about setting law goals for your entire lifetime. Why? Because finally, 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 when you do expire, whatever you've done in your lifetime, that's what you've traded your life for. The cost of a big dream, a small dream, or no dream. It's going to cost you your life. And the Bible speaks quite often about life goals. Moses was given a life goal to deliver the children of Israel to the promised land. At the point of delivery, his goal in his life was finished. Samson had a life goal as a conqueror, protector, and deliverer for his people. He departed from it many times when he played the fool with Delilah, but in the end, when he reached his, pushed those pillars out, he reached his life goal. Uh, we think of uh, John the Baptist. He had a life goal to proclaim the coming of the long awaited Messiah. He was faithful to that, that charge, even under the king's palace, which ended in his own decapitation, but he reached his life goal. Our Savior, the finality was a cross. That was his life goal. So life goals are recorded in the Bible. Well, do I remember as a young man at 26 years of age, I wrote on the back of a cereal package everything I had to have done by my 85th birthday before I moved into second gear. Set life goals. Okay, let's talk with you, Christy. Christy, what are the three things you want? Materialistically. Now, we're saying materialistically, but we don't want to do spiritually, we don't want to do mentally, or anything like that, but you can transfer this. We're doing this very quick tonight. Uh, profitable family business. So you want money. Money. What's the second thing you want? Property. You want real estate? What's the third thing you want? Have a look at her face. She's finding it difficult to think about it. These are the people you're talking to out there in the pews. You think you're getting through. You're not getting through. Come on, give me something. Guess something. Have a look at her face. <laughs> like pulling abscessed teeth, isn't it? <laughs> You'd think giving her something like this, I'd be able to blabber off a thousand things. Come on, Christy, give me something. Cars? <laughs> Come on, just give me something. A new car. A car, okay. She can have anything in the world, she wants a car. <laughs> uh, no, it said, see, this is what you're teaching. I'm trying to get through to you here. I'm trying to help you. 
You think that the message is getting through. It's not getting through because you have no examples. Right. Okay. All right, uh, let's talk with Wanda. Wanda, what, what would you like? Ability to quit my job and hire my own staff. Big button? The ability to quit so my own job. So you want some money. Just say money. own my own business. Money. You got your money. What's the second thing you want? <laughs> to be able to bless others at any given time. Well, there you got the money to do that. What else do you want? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, you got to come up with two things. Come on. Well, you put it all in one. I, 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 <laughs> Is, are you getting the message, pastors? Is this getting through to you at all? Do you want a business? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Here we are. Business. What else do you want? Come on, Wanda. Give me something. A new youth building for my church. A what? A new youth building for my church. So you want a building. Okay, building. Okay, let's talk with Mike. Mike, what are the three things you want, Mike? Money was a good start. Money. Um, a stable business. Uh, uh, a, a what? An ongoing stable business. You want a business. Okay. Third? Um, a, a legacy. Not, the... Not just money. Well, tell me what it is. You're, you're just using a word. All right, the business is part of it. I guess it's property or, or something. Oh, real estate, Myers. okay, real estate. Okay, let's talk with Lee. The first thing would be to expand our newfound business. Oh, you want your business, okay. Second thing? Which will be utilized to expand our newfound ministry. Well, what do you want, some money? We want money. We want a lot of money. Okay, that's all right. What's the third thing you want? To reach the unreached and tell the untold Well, how's that Jesus? materialistic? You're not listening to the question. Well, that's, that's what I want to do. Yeah, I know. Well, yes. You agreed to come up here and talk. Well, you've got to well, talk on material things. You can transfer it later. What I'm trying to do with you, Lee, is try to focus on something because you'll be able to expand. When you finish this, it's going to be really different than what you think. Can I pull the audience? No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you see, you see what I'm getting at here. Okay, come on. You've got, you've got, business, money, and money again. No, no, no. You, you've already got money. You see, see people, what I'm getting people, at. People, people, to. No, they're not materialistic. Not material. They won't like that if you tell them they're materialistic. <laughs> yeah, an airplane. A plane. Okay. Now. Let me tell you, they could have had the crown jewels of England. They could have had anything, anything at all. My heart's desire as a 26-year-old, I couldn't articulate words. I wanted to change the world. My wife said to me many times, she said, you are going to die. You've lost all this weight. You are so focused. Peter, this is not right. You're going to die. I don't look good in black. She said, <laughs> I said, I won't die. She said, what makes you think you won't die? I said, because God is teaching me and he knows what a stubborn ass I am. <laughs> Why not leave a legacy of 100 years for your children? Right. My grandchildren sit up in their bed, they've got a briefcase full of gold and they count it. Okay. What do we do? The first thing we did was to get them to dream. It was tough, wasn't it? It was tough. Uh, Lee, you've got the microphone. You're all nice people, but I lied to you. I'm only going to give you one. Which one do you want, Lee? You're going to have the business, the money, or the plane. You haven't asked for any fuel, but you can have as much money as you want. You can have a business. What, what would you like? I want the, the business. want the business, okay. Mike, what do you want, the money, the business, or the real estate? Money. Money, right. Wanda, what do you want, the money, the business, or the building? The money. Money, right. Christy, what do you want, the money, the real estate, or the car? <laughs> the money. The money, right. What do we do? The first thing we did, did was get them to dream. The second thing we did was to get them to select their dream, prioritize their dream. This is kid stuff. Ten-year-old kids can do this. Okay, what's this? Christy, 
How much money do you want? One amount for your whole lifetime. You can't come back and get any more. If, if you've got to pay your taxes, your tithes, your gifts, your offerings. Bless everyone you want to bless. One amount of money. How much would be enough? One amount. Give me a figure. One billion. Beg your pardon? One billion. One billion. Okay. Let's talk with Wanda. How much money do you want Wanda to do everything you want to do? Ten trillion. Ten trillion. Okay. Ten trillion. All right. Mike, how much money do you want? Grab the mic. Mike, grab the mic. A billion. A billion? One billion. And uh, Lee, how much do you want this business to provide for you to do all the things you want it to do? A starting point of 100 million. No, no, not a starting. This is final point. Okay, then let's make it a billion. A billion. One billion. What did we do? The first thing we did was to get them to dream. The second thing we did was to get them to prioritize their dream. The third thing we did was to get them to quantify their dream. Simple stuff. Now we do an analytical study on them. Okay, you've got the microphone, Lee. You're looking at one billion. We've got personal requirements. What, in your imaginations, is not reality. It's just dreaming. How clearly could you dream a million on a score of one to ten, ten being the highest? A million? Say, a billion. A billion. How, how clearly could you? It's got uh, three, six, nine, score one nine to ten. zeros after it, and it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, no, this is not reality. This okay. is just visual, visualizing it. I can see it on scale how of much? One, ten. one, one to ten. Eight. Eight. Right. What's your ability to handle pressure when the checks bounce, everything goes wrong, everyone that should stay with you leaves you? How do you handle pressure on a score of one to ten? Six. Six. What's your perception? You've made ten major decisions in your lifetime. How many were 100% correct? Remember, God is watching. <laughs> Seven. Seven. <clears throat> What's your daring? How game are you? Repeat, please. How game are you? Daring. Six. Six, right. Let's talk with Mike. Mike, one billion. What's your ma imagination tell you? An Four, eight. Eight, right. What's your ability to handle pressure? A, a six. Six, yeah. What's your perception? How many, you've made 10 major decisions in your lifetime. How many are correct? Four. Four. What's your daring? How game are you? Ten. Ten, right. Let's talk about that. Wanda, ten trillion. How clearly could you see that in your imagination? A ten. Ten. What's your, uh, what's your ability to handle pressure? Seven. Seven. What's your perception? Ten major decisions. How many were right? Five. Five, right. What's your daring? Ten. Ten. Okay. That took with Christy. Christy, one billion. What's your imagination tell you? How Nine. Hmm? Nine. Nine. What's your ability to handle pressure? Four. Four. Right. What's your perception? You made ten major decisions in your lifetime. How many were 100% correct? Four. Four. Okay. And daring. How game are you? Seven. Seven. Right. They've done well. Give them a clap. Hang on to the microphone. This is how they perceive themselves. They will change it later. They are being very good. They're stepping in for you. Don't think for one minute you would do it any different. I've changed it backwards and forwards. I've done it in countries all over the world. Nobody else in the world has this formula. This is the one that God gave me for my own life, and I'm just touching on it. And if there's pastors here who'd like me to come to their church, if I can fit it in, uh, let me know. And I do come free of charge. That is real. And uh, uh, we, But I'd only be interested in coming to see how many millionaires we could create in your church. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk again with uh, Christy. Uh, you've got the microphone. Uh, one billion. We're looking at basic requirements. We looked at, at uh, your imagination. What's your desire to have it? A ten. Ten. Listen to this. Your status quo. If you kept doing what you've been doing up till now for the rest of your life and not changing anything, what's the possibility of you getting it? On a scale of one to ten. You want to go behind one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's your work ethic? How hard do you work? 
Eight. Ten. Now listen to this, your knowledge absorption rating. If I was to talk to you about Einstein's theory of relativity or um, quantum physics, could you absorb that and pass that back to these people without error? How accurate would you be on a score of one to ten? Negative. Negative, okay. Okay, let's uh, talk to uh, Wanda. Wanda, ten trillion, what's your desire to have it? Twelve. Hmm? <laughs> Twelve. Well, you're up to ten, okay. Uh, status quo, if you kept doing for the rest of your life what you've been doing up till now and not changing anything, what's the possibility of you getting it? Two. Two, okay. What's your work ethic? How hard do you work? Ten. Right. And what's your knowledge absorption rating? Careful, I might ask you a question. <laughs> I know. Five. Five, okay. Right, let's, uh, Mike, one billion. What's your desire to have it? Ten. Ten. If you kept doing what you've been doing up till now for the rest of your life, what's the possibility of you getting it? Two. Two. What's your work ethic? How hard do you work? Nine. Nine. What's your knowledge absorption rating? Ten. Ten. Okay. The talk with Lee. One billion. What's your desire to have it? Nine. Nine. What's your status quo? You kept doing what you've been doing for the rest of your life, exactly the same as what you've been doing now. What would be the possibility of you getting one billion? Seven. Seven, right. What's your work ethic? Nine. Nine, and your knowledge absorption rating? Eight. Eight, right. Can you see what's happening here? We're getting an idea of how they see themselves. They will change it later. They're under pressure now. But I don't want you to follow the person, I want you to follow the process. What, what, watch what happens here. Send it right back to uh, Christy again. Christy, we're looking here at limiting factors. We've got one billion. On a score of one to 10, what's your cash position relative to one billion at the moment on a score of one to 10? Tell me, Christy. Negative. <laughs> yeah. You're off the board. Christy, do you have a plan that you can show me with deadlines for its attainment, the means of uh, transportation of how you're going to get there? You can show me after the meeting a plan to reach one billion? No. You're off the board again. What's your world view? If you had a world view, you'd have to know a great deal about law, economics, politics, trading. On a score of one to ten, what is your world view? By the way, mine's a three. Zero. <laughs> mm? Zero. Zero. Now, I'm going to ask you the hardest question you've ever been asked in your life, and I want each of you to think about this, and I want everyone else to think about it. When you were born, your mother took you in her arms. She counted your fingers and toes. She pulled you close to her, cuddled you in. She says she's gorgeous. She's lovely, she's a 10. When you were born, you were born to be a 10, Christy. No question about it. God made you to be a 10. Jesus was more than a 10. Paul was about a seven. <clears throat> Paul wasn't perfect. Here's the question. <clears throat> God created you to be a 10. Your potential is a 10. How much of that potential have you developed? up until now with a world changing event? One. One. Okay, I'm not gonna go through the others. Please sit down. Okay. Did that help? <clears throat> what I'm trying to do here is to give you a process and I'm trying to cram it into the time made we got uh, and what I'm going to do now is give you the formula. Now let me say, if there's anyone here that wants those programs, Destiny of the Third Millennium, I need to see you privately after you've paid for it because I want to take you up to an entirely different level in about five minutes. But, uh, and you have to fill in a form because uh, we uh, keep track of people because we've had so many wonderful successes with it. Here's your formula, goals. One, define your goal. 
you haven't got a goal, make finding a goal your goal, now you've got one. We have proven it. <coughs> We have proven scientifically if a person 60 or 70 years of age sets a long-term goal, puts their spirit, their heart, their mind in it, it will actually reprogram their body clock. Yeah. Define your goal. <clears throat> Two, set out your strategy. Plans in progress mean power. Step movement towards your goal. Thirdly, plan out your problems. <clears throat> Everyone has problems. I am totally, absolutely colorblind. I was married to my wife 20 years before I found out she wasn't black. <laughs> but, but I sold more paint in Australia than any other human being. I also sold ladies fashion. Why? Because I memorized the, the, the swatch numbers. Uh, everybody has problems. So plan out your problem. Put a date to get it out the way. Four, build in reserves. This is a protectionist role. Remember the wise virgins who trimmed their lamps. The one that had reserves went to the party. That's why our corporations grow every year because we have reserves. Build in reserves, have financial reserves. Men, have some financial reserves. Your wives need some financial security. Am I right, ladies? Yes. Did you hear that, fellas? How much financial security is enough for a woman? Just a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> but have, now, it may seem that I've been a little critical with you on a few issues, and I have been, and I make no apology for that. But with this, it's going to hurt your feelings a bit. But you are very lousy in spending money on your brains. You want the church to supply it for you. Grow up. I've never seen anything happen through a borrowed book. Start spending some money on your brains. If you want to compete, if you want to understand the business world, let me tell you something that happened in one of the biggest churches in Australia. They asked me to speak at their convention during the break between another speaker they asked me to speak to 150 pastors who wanted to know how to win business people to Christ. Oh my goodness, I had to do it in 15 minutes. They pushed them into a room. I said, well, put up your hands, all the pastors who are serious about winning business people to Christ. Every hand went up. I said, leave it there. And what I want you to do, remember God is watching. Drop your hand if you've read more than five business books that have nothing to do with the gospel over the last 12 months, every hand stayed up. I said, if God had asked you to go to China and win Asians to Christ, you would have studied the culture. You're not studying the business culture. And I walked out, I said, you're wasting my time. Okay, okay, building reserves. And I hope you can see I'm fit. You'll need a gun, a whip and a chair to handle me. Uh, build, in, build in financial reserves. I punch punching bags, I run... Uh, um, Relate to time frames. To time frames. Time is an opportunity looking for a cause. Time is God's rare gift of unperturable power. Six, create a master plan. Plan. And seven, action today. I'll stay outside. God bless you. I've done the best in the time I've got available. Thank you so much. <laughs>